Now, what you're looking at is a Toyota uh, Costa um, of the year 2007, right? And um, pretty much this model was being manufactured from your 2006 all the way to your 2010, right? And the problem with this bus is that it has got a DPF malfunction, right? Uh, and you know the usual story when these uh, vehicles start to have a DPF malfunction is that they will not uh, perform it they will not perform well right so it's it's right now it's flashing a, a dpf warning light inside um the dash display let me just uh, show you right um, so it will start flashing the moment that you turn it on right let me just turn it on for you to see um so by starting it already you can see right away that there is a light which is flashing that is a dpf warning light that is starting to flash and what ends up happening is that after a period of driving it it will show a check engine light and it will not rev beyond um 1100 i know some will not rev beyond 2000 2200 somewhere there that's pretty much the story that's happening with this um you know truck sorry this um um toyota costa bus right um and we're going to be resolving the dpf issue on this bus and um hopefully um if you're having the same problem you would have to, you then understand um, the available solutions on what you need to do in order to solve um a dpf malfunction um, on a toyota um, costa bus <laughs> So let's say it's the first time that you're joining me and you have no idea what a DPF is and exactly what it is doing um, on your vehicle, right? Um, and you're joining me for the first time, right? Um, I'm going to start from the top um, and pretty much try to explain what a DPF is and uh, other relevant information that will help you um, before we get to the actual solution, right? So a DPF is a system of emission which has been implemented on your uh, most of your vehicles from 2004 coming to present, uh, right? Uh, particularly those that have been manufactured in your European countries and in your Japanese countries. The purpose of this um, DPF is to limit the amount of carbon footprint that is getting into the atmosphere, right? That's how this system is working, right? So w what happens um, is that um, these DPF systems are systems which have been designed in such a way that they are supposed to last the entire lifetime of the vehicle, right? Um, they are different from your oil filters, your uh, fuel filters, and your other filters that you change on a regular basis, right? This, this system is actually located onto your exhaust, right? Um, and pretty much what it is doing is to filter the amount of carbon uh, suit that is getting into the atmosphere. That's the job of that DPF. So you'll find out that it will come with um, sensors and tubes which are connected to it. And the job of those sensors and tubes is to measure its efficiency, right? And to um, when it starts to see that it's now becoming clogged and they are starting to become issues, it will initiate its self-cleaning processes, which we call um, regeneration, whether forced or passive. Um, and it does that whilst you are driving. You won't even know that it is it has initiated its cleaning cleaning processes when you, when you are driving, right? So that's what a DPF is, and that is how it works, right? So um, what ends up happening with these DPFs is that they fail, right? And they are three reasons, right? Three main reasons why these DPFs fail, right? So the first reason why these DPFs fail is number one, your driving habit, right? Now you need to understand these reasons why they fail because they also uh, affect the solutions that you're going to implement, right? So the first reason why they fail is your, uh, like I said, your driving habit, right? Um, and what I mean by your driving habit is if you're using um, that vehicle for a, sh for a short distance, right? You're going to have a scenario where that DPF clogs far much faster, right? Because you're not giving it enough time um, to do that cleaning process, which I explained earlier, right? So it requires or it really favors an environment where it is used particularly on a highway condition because um, then it will be able to do its um, self-cleaning processes without being interrupted, right? So that's the reason number one, your driving habit. The second reason why these DPFs fail is because of um, uh, poor quality of fuel, right? And we normally see a situation of poor quality of fuel in our third world countries, right? Where generally our fuel is not of the best quality compared to what you're seeing in your European countries, what you're seeing in your Japan or your other first world countries, right? So already you see that as the 
as the engine is burning the fuel, right, it's going to come out with some contaminants. And those contaminants are going to end up sticking inside the DPF, right? So the vehicle in general, when it's trying to do that self-cleaning process, it would fail simply because inside the exhaust are contaminants which have started to what to actually block them so that that really is an issue that happens especially in your third world countries but even in your first world countries if you put contaminated fuel you might end up seeing uh, a situation of um of of a, of a dpf failure or a dpf malfunction right so the final reason why those DPS fail is uh, a situation which arises as you operate your vehicle, where your vehicle starts to have, where the air fuel ratios um, start to deteriorate. And there are a bunch of reasons why your air to fuel ratios uh, deteriorate on your vehicle, right? Including um, a turbo that is getting weak, uh, including a situation where your pipes start to 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 leak leak your air, your boost air, or your injectors are overfueling. What I'm really trying to say about failing air to fuel ratio is that I'm simply saying that um, the air to fuel ratio becomes um, goes into a state where it is no longer optimum, right? Where your air is less and your fuel becomes more, right? So I just touched a few of the issues that causes uh, that scenario, but there are a bunch of reasons why um, you start to see your air to fuel ratios um, beginning to fail, right? So the symptoms of failure that you are going to see um, when you've got a DPF failure is pretty much there are four things that are going to happen, which are going to show you that now you are having a DPF problem. So the first one is that when that DPF light begins to flash, it is supposed to flash. Um, it, 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 it is supposed to flash and uh, sometimes not even flash at all. Right. If your vehicle is maintaining its um, its 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 state of the DPF in the best condition, so when you still see it flash, most of the times is going to be accompanied by a check engine light. Right. Um, that check engine light will be difficult to clear. Right. That's what was going to follow, and then immediately you're going to see. Um, as the as the second thing that happens is that you're going to see your vehicle deliberately limiting power as your check engine light is on, right? So when I'm saying deliberately limiting power is you're going to see that um, it might not rev beyond 1,100 or it might not rev beyond sometimes 2,200 as I explained earlier on, right? So that is that is what you start to see as 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 as, as becoming a problem. And sometimes I've seen other cases where you know customers phone us and they say, you know what, as my vehicle flashes that light it starts to feel weak. That's some of the things that you see, right? Not necessarily a change light might follow, but the, the process of it flashing that DPF light, you start to feel the car being weak. Sometimes you might even park it on the side of the road because it becomes then dangerous to drive a car which is weak as you are trying to maybe go up a climb or something like that, right? So the third um, thing that you're going to see which is going to follow is um, uh, a high uh, consumption, right? fuel consumption. So pretty much vehicles that are starting to have a DPF malfunction, they consume a lot of fuel. Remember what I talked about, that self-cleaning process. Um, that self-cleaning process uses fuel, right, in order to complete. So it might enter into a mode whereby it constantly tries to uh, go through that self-cleaning process and it starts to consume a lot of fuel to a point that sometimes the vehicle feels uneconomical to actually run, right? So that's the third thing that will happen. The fourth thing in the, and this usually happens when your vehicle is, um, when your vehicle DPF has been breached. Here you are going to see it puffing clouds of white smoke. And you see that puffing of white clouds, um, puffing of uh, clouds of white smoke when it is um, stationary or when you're in traffic. That's when you usually see it. But as you are driving along um, or as you are in the highway, you won't see those clouds. You only see it as you are stationary or when you are just um, in traffic. That's pretty much what really happens um, is the four things that happen uh, when you've got a uh, 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 um, a problem with a DPF, right? And um, when you then connect a diagnostic tool, let's say you go to a, um, uh, a diagnostic specialist, right? And you connect a diagnostic tool, there are a bunch of fault codes that you're going to see, right? Um, particularly if a check engine light is on. Now, you might have a DPF problem, but then the check engine light might not come on. Uh, but in the case, 
But in that case, you see those other issues where your fuel consumption is high, that light flashes, and sometimes you've got episodes of loss of power. Those will, will happen. But there are some cases where the check engine light comes, and when that check engine light comes, you are going to see uh, the force that you are looking at uh, coming on the screen. Those are the list of fault codes that you are going to see as as confirming that you've actually got a DPF uh, malfunction, especially when your check engine light is on. Right. So um, there are. A number of solutions, I would say three solutions that are at your disposal. Uh, the moment that you see you've got these problems, three solutions which are at your disposal. And I'm going to touch on um, the advantages um, and the disadvantages of w each of those solutions. So the first solution that is available to your disposal, um, which I recommend to be the first thing that you can try, um, that is going to be your um, uh, regeneration, forced regeneration, right? So this is... Uh, mostly implemented by your diagnostic specialist where they're going to connect their diagnostic to and they and they put the vehicle into uh, forced regeneration mode right um, when it's now in forced regeneration mode the vehicle will start revving itself and doing all kinds of stuff for the next um, probably 20 minutes or 30 minutes some some vehicles may even require an hour uh, they will do that it's a process whereby they are cleaning the exhaust right um and it does that, right? And it simply does that for that one hour period or whatever period of time that it, it, it takes, right? Now, the advantage of this solution is that it is cheap. That's the biggest advantage of this solution. Um, and um, however, the disadvantage is that um, sometimes it can be a very temporary solution, which can work from anything from one hour afterwards. It can work for just an hour, for just a day, for just a week. It can just be a temporary measure. Um, that's the main disadvantage about it. And the reason why it feels like a temporary measure is because remember what I explained earlier to say um, there are situations that cause uh, your DPF to fail, right? So unless you go out there and correct those um, reasons that are causing your DPF to fail, you are going to wind up um, having problems, right? So you'd find, particularly in third world countries, this solution of third of regeneration uh here in the third world countries you find out that it is very very short term right it's it can work <laughs> from just one day it can just work one day or even just an hour or just you know that's the main disadvantage right but in your first world countries this is something that you can apply but you have to change your driving habits um in order for it to keep for the solution to hold right then um the second solution that you 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 have at your disposal and this solution starts um this solution is will then become a solution to you in the case where regeneration is is failed because when regeneration is failed it means your dpf is 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 already dead right so the next solution that is on the table for you is to actually go and buy a brand new dpf and there's no two ways about it you have to go out there and buy a brand new dpf unfortunately um in your in if you are in a third world country like ourselves there is also a third solution but if you're in your first world country um and you've come to the point where you are now supposed to um replace a dpf there's no two ways about it you just have to replace it right um but for people who are in third world countries i don't recommend this solution because um obviously you are just throwing money in the toilet because remember what i talked about to say that here in africa we sorry here in the third world countries we have got um contaminated uh fuel uh, or fuel issues in general. So when you buy a brand new DPF, it's not going to be long until you have a DPF problem. And to tell you, I've seen a number of people who are now on their second or even on their third DPFs. And sometimes these DPFs are pretty much expensive. Um, as of today, the date that we made this video, today is the 14th of July, um, 2020. The cost of the DPF is about 1,500 US dollars. That's the price of replacing the DPF. And this is not something that you want to buy on a frequent basis, right? It's not something that you want to even replace at all, right? Um, so this is why I don't recommend because I'm saying it's pretty much expensive, right? Um, but in your first world countries, knock yourself out. This will uh, this will actually work. Um, and then lastly, the is the last resort is the last solution available for you, um, which is what we recommend, especially for those um, in your third world countries like ourselves, right? This is where we convert your vehicle to non-DPF, right? And this is a solution that we specialize here with um, at the DPF team, right? We help you convert your vehicle to non-DPF. And what I'm saying by converting it to non-DPF is that you find out that um, already we are manufacturing 
uh, vehicles like this, a bus like this. It's already being manufactured. Like I'll give you an example. We are in, in, a, in, a, in a country in, in, we are in Zimbabwe, right? Which is in Southern Africa. Uh, in South Africa, we do have plants which actually um, assemble these um, Toyota buses. And the and when they're being assembled, they're coming out without a DPF, right? So already our laws here in Africa, they do not um, um, force us to put this DPF um, system. This is why manufacturers who are already in Africa are making vehicles without DPF system. So then if you import your vehicle from your Japan, if you import your vehicle from your UK, it means we can convert it to non-DPF. And it's by far cheaper, right, than buying a brand new DPF. And it's also lifetime. Right. And in particular, our solution comes with a lifetime guarantee. Right. That's the big advantage that then follows uh, with that solution. Right. So it comes with a lifetime guarantee and you know that it's going to work for the rest of the life of the vehicle. Right. Now, I'm going to talk about the advantages of our solution and why um, it then um, why it, it, it then uh, is something that you should consider, right? So the advantages that you're going to see after having done a conversion to non-DPFs are, number one, you're going to see that um, those check lights um, and th that DPF light, those lights are just going to switch off. You're not going to see them flashing and bothering as you are driving again, right? That's number one. Number two, you are going to see an improvement in power, right? You're going to see an improvement in the vehicle's performance in terms of power. Now, remember what I talked about, that self-cleaning process that the vehicle undergoes, right? So it will direct all of its fuel for the purpose of driving the vehicle, for the purpose of um, um, making the vehicle uh, move forward. Right, so just because it's no longer um, sharing that f the the fuel for performance with the fuel for um, um, doing the self cleaning process, it means that you are generally going to see an improvement in the vehicle's um, performance in terms of its power. Where it was limiting to one thousand one hundred RPMs, as I explained earlier, it will rev all the way to four thousand RPMs all the time. Right, and um, another advantage that you're going to see is that. Um, in terms of fuel consumption, you see a dramatic improvement in the fuel consumption simply because it's no longer wasting fuel or using that fuel to do that self-cleaning process, right? That's the other advantage that you're going to see. And if it was come, if it was puffing smoke whilst, whilst it was in traffic, again, that smoke is going to clear off. You're never going to see that smoke coming out again, right? So those are the advantages that follow with our, our solution where we convert these uh, vehicles um, to non-DPF, right? So as long as you are watching this video, as long as you are able to contact the numbers uh, that are on the screen, doesn't matter whether you are um, in our country or outside of our country, as long as you are able to contact those numbers that you are looking at, at the screen, it means we have a solution for you and it means we can actually help you, right? Um, you can contact and um, we should be able to, to, to assist you and um, to resolve the situation which is on your vehicle, right? So here on, I'm going to take you to the... Um, uh, video of the vehicle that we were working on um, that Toyota Costa bus right um, so the problem it had was that it could not exceed 80 when the check engine light comes on um, it could not exceed uh, between 70 and 80 where they need to start limiting the RPM so as we were testing it you're going to see that we were, we were driving it right to different uh, under different conditions and we were even driving it to get it to as, 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 as fast as 140 kilometers per hour so that we just um, satisfy ourselves that this this vehicle or this bus is now working as it should right so if you've got any questions feel free you can contact us on the numbers on the screen or you can leave a comment uh, below in the in the comments box uh, thank you for watching and subscribe to our channel